The SI unit for a force is Newton. One Newton is the force that accelerates one kilogram of mass at one meter per second squared. Therefore, the answer to this question is the force required to accelerate in the direction of the force, a mass of one kilogram at one meter per second squared. To find the percentage uncertainty, first we need to find the absolute uncertainty of the perimeter of the paper. In addition and subtraction, absolute uncertainty can be found by adding all the other absolute uncertainties. Let's say that 30 centimeters is the width and 20 centimeters is the length. Both have the absolute uncertainty of 0.5 centimeters. The perimeter can be found by adding the width and length twice each. To find the absolute uncertainty of the perimeter, add the absolute uncertainty of length twice and the absolute uncertainty of width twice. Now that we know the perimeter and its absolute uncertainty, find the fractional uncertainty of the perimeter and multiply by 100 to find the percentage uncertainty. Here is force F and G. When F is reversed, the direction of the arrow points in the opposite direction, the size remains the same. When G is halved, the size of the arrow halves, but the direction remains the same. Add these two forces. Join a line from the beginning to the end to find the resultant force. At time t, both balls are at the same distance above the ground. Let's call this height d. This means that at time t, ball 1 travels downwards a distance of h minus d and ball 2 travels upwards a distance of d. To find the time, let's focus on one ball at a time. Ball 1, which is initially at rest, travels downwards. Taking downward as the positive direction, use the equation given in the data booklet to get your first equation. Do the same for ball 2. We are told that the initial velocity is u. Take upwards as the positive direction and use the same formula to get your second equation. The equation has been intentionally rearranged to make half g t squared the subject. Put the two equations together, simplify to find the time. The projectile in this question moves at an angle. Frictional forces, in this case air resistance, always acts in the opposite direction of the movement. Since the resistive force is also at an angle, it can be split into the horizontal component and vertical components. This means that the horizontal component of the acceleration of the projectile is non-zero due to the horizontal components of the air resistance. And the vertical component of the acceleration of the projectile projectile is greater than 9.8 meters per second squared due to the vertical components of the air resistance adding to the vertical force. Here is the free body diagram of the moving mass. Since there is vertical acceleration, the upward reaction force equals the downward weight. Use the equation given in the data booklet to find the equation for frictional force. Substitute in the reaction force for weight. To find the coefficient of dynamic friction, use Newton's second law. The resultant force here is the pulling force minus the frictional force. Rearrange to make the coefficient of dynamic friction the subject, Put in the numbers and calculate to find your answer. The energy transferred to the mass is equal to the change in gravitational potential energy of the mass. 20 kilograms is lifted a vertical distance of 0.60 meters. Use the equation given in the data booklet to calculate the energy transferred. The number of times the mass is lifted can be found by dividing the total energy transferred with the energy transferred doing one lift. Put in the numbers and do the calculation to find your answer. Here is a free body diagram of the moving mass. The keyword here is constant velocity. If the velocity is constant, then it means that the change in velocity is zero, which means acceleration is zero, which means resultant force is zero. Since the resultant force is zero for both horizontal and vertical components, the horizontal force equals the frictional force and the reaction force equals the weight. Use the data booklet to find the equation for frictional force. Substitute in the reaction force for weight. 
Previously, we found that the horizontal force equals the frictional force, therefore, horizontal force equals mu mg. Substitute the force into the power equation given in the data booklet to find your answer. The area underneath a force time graph is the impulse. Calculate the area of the graph given in the question. Make sure to take note of the units. Impulse equals to the change in momentum. Change in momentum equals to mass times change in velocity. The impulse here is the area underneath the graph. Take out u since the initial velocity is zero and make v the subject. Put in the values of the area and mass to find your answer. The equilibrium temperature can be found by taking two steps. First, mix sample 1 and 2 to find its equilibrium temperature. Next, mix the previous mixture and sample 3 to find the final equilibrium temperature. Let's first mix sample 1 and sample 2. The mass of each sample is given in the question. The specific heat capacity is the same for all samples since they are the same liquid. The temperature change for sample 1 is 60 minus final temperature since the final temperature will be lower than 60 degrees Celsius. The temperature change for sample 2 is final temperature minus 30 since the final temperature will be higher than 30 degrees Celsius. Energy will be transferred from sample 1 to sample 2. Energy lost by the sample 1 will be the energy gained by sample 2. Substitute in the equation and put in the values. Simplify and rearrange to find the final temperature of mixture 1 and 2. Let's repeat the same calculation but this time for mixture 1 and 2 and sample 3. The mass of mixture 1 and 2 is 4m and its temperature change 45 minus final temperature. The 45 degrees Celsius was found previously. Energy lost by the sample 1 and 2 will be the energy gained by sample 3. Use the equation and put in all the values. Simplify to find the final equilibrium temperature of all three samples. Note that the order in which the samples are mixed does not matter. You will end up with the same answer if done right. First, let us use the two equations to find the number of moles into one. Note that only one of them is given in the data booklet. Since the mass is constant, the equation can be simplified to number of molecules inversely proportional to molar mass. This means that the smaller the molar mass, the greater the number of molecules. Now, let us determine the molar mass of each compound given in the question. Remember that the top left number of the element symbol is the molar mass. Since CH4 has the smallest molar mass, it will have the greatest number of molecules. Statement 1 is correct. Unit for the Boltzmann's constant is joule per Kelvin. The constant can be found in the data booklet. Statement 2 is correct. From the equation given in the data booklet, we can see that the Boltzmann's constant equals gas constant divided by Avogadro's constant. Statement 3 is incorrect. The same equation can be rearranged to make the Boltzmann's constant the subject, but the question is missing the 2 over 3. The gradient of a displacement time graph is the velocity. We can think of the position shown in the y-axis as displacement. Position A and C have zero gradients, which means that at those points, the velocity is zero. Although the question does not specifically state that this is a simple harmonic motion, we can assume it is. The acceleration and displacement of a simple harmonic motion is always opposite to each other. This means that the positive position at A will have a negative acceleration. So there we have our answer. The wavelength of a wave can be found from the displacement distance graph. The wavelength is found to be 1.5 meters and the speed of sound is given as 270 meters per second. Use the equation for speed of wave given in the data booklet. Rearrange for frequency, put in the values to find your answer. 
There are two equations with intensity, amplitude, and distance from the source. Making this equation into one equation, we get amplitude inversely proportional to the distance from the source. This means that if the amplitude changes from 2z to z, in other words, if the amplitude halves, then the distance will increase from l to 2l or in other words, the distance will double. Therefore, to get from L to 2L, the person must move a distance of L. Wire 2 has double the diameter of wire 1. This is the same as saying wire 2 has double the radius of wire 1. Through the law of conservation of charge, we know that the amount of charge passing through wire 1 must be the same as the amount of charge passing through wire 2. Since this is happening at the same rate, we can say that the current in both wires is the same. To find the drift speed in wire 2, first find the relationship between the drift speed and the radius using the equation given to us in the data booklet. The current, the charge of the charge carrier, and the charge density are all constant. This leaves us with the drift speed inversely proportional to the radius squared. Increasing the radius by 2 will decrease the drift speed by 4. This means that the drift speed in wire 2 is a quarter of the drift speed in wire 1. Dividing them together will give us an answer of 1 over 4. We need to know the EMF of the cell in order to solve this question. First, we need to find the total resistance of the circuit shown in the question. All resistors have been given the resistance of R since they are all identical. The two resistors in parallel on the right can be considered as a single resistor by using the equation given in the data booklet. Now determine the total resistance of the two resistors in series by using the equation also given in the data booklet. EMF can be found by multiplying the current with the total resistance. The EMF of the cell is found to be 4.5R. Now, let us arrange the three resistors in series with the same cell. Use the equation for resistors in series to find the total resistance. Next, divide the EMF of the cell with the newly found total resistance to find the current. First, let us remind ourselves that the left-hand rule can be used to find the direction of the magnetic force on a wire with current. Point the first finger in the direction of the magnetic field and while maintaining the shape of the hand, point the second finger in the direction of the current. The direction your thumb points to will be the direction of the force. In this question, a loop of wire with current flowing in the clockwise direction lies in a magnetic field directed into the screen. Let's focus on the top part Part of the wire. The current flows to the right and the magnetic field is into the screen. Point the first finger, which indicates the direction of the field, into the screen and point the second finger, which indicates the direction of the current, right. This will result in the thumb pointing upwards, which means that the magnetic force is upwards. Use the left-hand rule on the right side of the loop. The only difference is that the current is now pointing downwards. You will find that the magnetic force points to the right. Repeat this process for the bottom and left part of the loop. The magnetic forces will point to the bottom and left respectively. Magnetic force acts outwards on every point on the loop. This will increase the radius of the loop. First, let us derive an equation for the centripetal force with period in the equation. Here are a few ways to do so. Substitute V squared over R from the centripetal acceleration equation into the equation for centripetal force, or put these two equations together, or simply use F equals MA and consider A as the centripetal force. The question kindly tells us that the weight of hanging mass provides the centripetal force. Centripetal force equals the weight, which equals large mg. Rearrange the equation to make large m divided by small m. Pi squared is roughly 10, R is 0.25 meters, G is also roughly 10, and T squared is 0.25. Cancel the numbers to find your answer. 
from the given distances, we can derive that the distance between the moon and point X is large D minus small d. At point X, the gravitational fields due to the Earth and moon cancel out. This means that the net gravitational field strength is zero, which means that the gravitational field strength due to Earth equals the gravitational field strength due to the moon. Use the equation for the gravitational field strength given in the data booklet and put in the relevant distances. Cancel out the gravitational constant to find your answer. Fact: The unified atomic mass unit is defined as 12th of the mass of a neutral atom of carbon-12. Note that the data booklet also gives the unified atomic mass unit in terms of kilograms. Let's start by reminding ourselves of alpha decay and beta decay. Specifically, pay attention to the change in the number of protons. Alpha decay is when an alpha particle is emitted from the nucleus of an unstable nuclei. This results in the proton number of the new element decreasing by 2. Beta minus decay is when a beta minus particle and an antineutrino are emitted from the nucleus of an unstable nuclei. This results in the proton number of the new element increasing by 1. Beta plus decay is when a beta plus particle and a neutrino are emitted from the nucleus of an unstable nuclei. This results in the proton number of the new element decreasing by 1. The sequence of decay must be in such a way that the final element is an isotope of the initial element. In other words, the number of protons must be the same. You would have to try out all the options to find which one ends up with the same number of protons. In option B, beta minus increases proton by 1, then alpha decreases by 2, and final beta minus again increases proton by 1, which results in the overall number of protons remaining the same. So here's our answer. All other options will end up with fewer number of protons. Paradigm shift is the fundamental change in the basic concepts and experimental practices of a scientific discipline. In other words, the way of understanding and thinking of certain matters. Initially, scientists viewed mass and energy as two separate physical quantities. There had to be a paradigm shift in order for the development of the equivalence of mass and energy. The specific energy can be found by dividing energy with the mass. The specific energy of fusion of hydrogen would be 0.019 U divided by 5. 5 comes from adding mass of hydrogen 2 and hydrogen 3 together. The specific energy of fission of uranium would be 0.190 U divided by 235. We do not have to worry too much about the units since we will be finding the ratio of these two. Divide the two specific energies. We can use a simple mathematical trick to make our calculations a little easier. Dividing 0.019U with 0.190U will leave us 10 at the bottom, and dividing 235 with 5 will give us approximately 50 at the top. 50 divided by 10 gives us 5. So there we have our answer. The maximum power supplied by the wind turbine equals the rate of increase in gravitational potential energy. The rate of increase in gravitational potential energy is the potential energy divided by time. The maximum power supplied by the wind turbine must be also multiplied by the efficiency since only 50% of the power generated is transferred to the pump. Rearrange the equation to make the rate of mass pumped the subject. The calculations for such questions can usually be left till the very end. This could make calculations simpler. For example, 100 divided by 10 leaves us 10 at the top, and 5 cubed, which is 125, divided by 12.5 leaves us 10 at the top. We get 30 kilogram per second, which means that 30 kilograms of water is pumped every second. From Wien's displacement law given in the data booklet, we can derive that the peak wavelength is inversely proportional to the temperature. This will give us a graph that looks like this. All variables that have an inversely proportional relationship will have a graph that looks like this. Be aware of option D. You will be familiar with the shape. However, the shape of the graph of option D is the general curve of a black body radiation you get on an intensity wavelength graph. 
If an incident light reflects from a medium that has a higher refractive index, the reflected light will have a phase change of pi. If an incident light reflects from a medium that has lower refractive index, the reflected light will have a phase change of zero. Note that refraction does not cause the light to change phase. The reflected light from the air oil boundary will have a phase change of pi since oil has a higher refractive index. The reflected light from the oil water boundary will have a phase change of zero since water has a lower refractive index than oil. These two reflected lights will have a phase difference of pi. The constructive and destructive interference equations given in the data booklet can be used when the two reflections have a phase difference of pi. In other words, these equations are used when one reflection has a phase change of pi and the other has a phase change of zero. In this question, we want to use the constructive interference equation since we want to see the reflected light. Rearrange to make the thickness the subject. Set m to 0 and n to 1.5. Simplify to find your answer. Note that if both reflections have a phase change of pi resulting in phase change of 2 pi, then the equations are switched around. The previous constructive interference equation becomes the destructive interference equation and vice versa. Keep this in mind since it is not mentioned in the data booklet. The angle between the two stars can be taken as 2 times 10 to the power minus 7 radians since that is the minimum angle of separation for the telescope to be able to resolve the image. Here is a typical diagram of the stars and the telescope. Since the angle is very small, there are two changes we can make. First, we can draw the diagram such that it makes a right angled triangle. Now we can use trigonometry to write down the equation connecting the distances and the angle. Next tan theta can be approximated to theta. Once again, this is possible since the angle is very, very small. Rearrange to make x the subject, put in the values to find your answer. First method to solve this question is to make x the stationary point. Let's focus on the ambulance. The ambulance approaches point x at a speed of 40 meters per second. Use the equation given in the data booklet to find the frequency observed by x. Note that minus is used in the denominator since the source is moving towards the observer. Next, let's focus on the car. Point x is now the source and the car is the observer. The frequency of sound emitted from x is the frequency we found earlier. Use the equation given in the data booklet to find the frequency observed by the car. Note that minus is used in the numerator since the observer is moving away from the source. Substitute the frequency fx, cancel out to find your answer. The other way of solving this question is to use relativity. Imagine being the driver of the car. You are stationary relative to the car because you're moving with it. The speed of the ambulance relative to you would be 40 minus 20, giving us 20 meters per second. And the speed of sound relative to you would be V minus 20. Use the equation for moving source. Put in the correct values to find the same answer. The electric field strength between two plates can be found by potential difference between the two plates divided by distance between the two plates. Note that this equation is not given in the data booklet. Combine this equation with the charge equation given in the data booklet. The combined equation is the same as the one shown in statement 1, which means statement 1 is correct. Electric field lines are at right angles to the plates. This makes statement 2 correct. And lastly, the equipotential surfaces are parallel to the plates. This makes statement 3 correct. The electric field strength between two plates can be found by potential difference between the two plates divided by distance between the two plates. Note that this equation is not given in the data booklet. Combine this equation with the electric field strength equation given in the data booklet. Rearrange to make charge Q the subject to find your answer. 
The gravitational force acts as the centripetal force on a satellite orbiting a planet. Combine this equation with the equation shown on the right. Note that all these starting equations can be found in the data booklet. Simplifying and rearranging this equation gives you an equation in terms of period and radius. This may look a little complicated, but the important conclusion is that the period squared is directly proportional to the radius of orbit cubed. This means that since the radius of orbit of satellite Y is greater, the period for satellite Y is also greater. Now let's have a look at the total energies. The kinetic energy of a mass in orbital motion can be found by combining the equation for orbital speed and the general kinetic energy equation. The total energy of a mass in orbital motion can be found by adding kinetic energy with potential energy. The equation for kinetic energy and total energy are not in the data booklet, so be sure to memorize them or at least know how to find them. Satellite Y has a greater radius of orbit than satellite X. This means that the total energy energy of satellite Y is less negative than satellite X. Less negative means that the total energy of satellite Y is greater than satellite X. For example, minus 2 is greater than minus 10. Just as an extra, here is a total energy distance graph. Gradients of a graph can be found by dividing delta y with delta x. Draw a triangle on the graph to find the values for delta y and delta x. Note that y-axis is the voltage and x-axis is the distance. The voltage on the graph is also the EMF induced on the bar and the distance given is the length of the bar. Keep this in mind for the next part. Equation for induced EMF from the data booklet can be arranged to make EMF over L. EMF over L is the gradients we found earlier. Rearrange to make speed V the subject, put in the values of the gradient and magnetic field strength, and calculate to find your answer. Faraday's law states that the induced EMF is proportional to the rate of change of magnetic flux. This means that EMF is induced only when there is change in magnetic flux. Ammeter reading before T is zero since there is no change in magnetic flux. Therefore, there is no induced EMF. The moment the switch is turned on, there is change in magnetic flux. This induces EMF which causes currents of flow. However, the change in magnetic flux is only for a very short time and no further change occurs. As a result, the amount of current flowing will decrease. Step-up transformers increase the voltage. This decreases the current. We can derive this from the power equation where power is constant. Power loss can be calculated by P equals I squared R. As the current decreases, the power dissipated to the surroundings also decreases. This will reduce energy loss. To summarize, the purpose of using a step-up transformer is to increase the voltage to decrease the energy loss. Time constant is the time taken for the capacitor to charge or discharge to 63.2% of its maximum voltage. This makes statement 1 correct and statement 2 incorrect. For statement 2 to be correct, the voltage should be changed to 0.368 volts. Statement 3 is also correct. This equation is given in the data booklet. First, let us find the work function. The minimum frequency required to eject photoelectrons from a metal surface is said to be F. This means that the work function is HF. Now let us find the maximum kinetic energy of the photoelectrons using the equation given in the data booklet. The frequency is now 2F. We are also told that the kinetic energy of the photoelectrons is K. This means that K equals HF. Now increase the frequency to 4F. Subtracting the work function will give us 3HF. Since K equals HF, the final answer is 3K. The Bohr model for hydrogen features orbital radius, quantized energy, and quantized angular momentum. This makes statement 1 and 3 correct. Statement 2 is the equation for radioactive decay. Here is a full summary of the Bohr model. Pause the video to have a closer look. And here are the limitations of Bohr's model. 
Alpha particle energies and gamma ray energies are distinct. This provides evidence for the existence of nuclear energy levels. The beta particle, however, produce a continuous energy spectrum. This can only mean that an additional product, which we now call neutrino, is formed during beta decay. Let's start by finding the nuclear density. The volume of the nucleus can be found by using the equation for a sphere. Substitute in the equation for nuclear radius and simplify. The mass of the nucleus can be found by multiplying the nucleon number with the unified atomic mass unit. Put these two into the density equation and simplify. We can conclude that the nuclear density is constant and does not depend on the nucleon number. The nuclear density of oxygen will be the same as that of hydrogen. Now to find the radius. Use the equation given in the data booklet to obtain the equation for hydrogen and oxygen. Divide the radius of oxygen with the radius of hydrogen. Fermi radius constant will cancel out. The power to one third can also be rewritten. Cube root of eight is two. The the radius of hydrogen was given in R, rearranged to find the radius of oxygen.